God's Word, upon which we base our message this morning, is recorded for us in the Old Testament book, the prophet Amos, the seventh chapter, verses 7 through 15, words that we heard read just a few moments ago. In the name of Jesus, dear friends, have you ever heard the statement, the more things change, the more they stay the same? Have you ever heard that? Is it really a true statement? In reality, the world has changed a lot since the days of the prophet Amos in the early 8th century, the uh, writer of this, uh, this uh, word of God that we have before us today. Surely the Israel, the nation of Israel of his day is nothing like our North American existence in the 21st century today. There is an exception, though. God has not changed. God certainly has not changed. He's still the same. His relationship with people has not changed. And the relationship that people have with God has not changed. The very same message that God sent to Amos to proclaim to Israel in the 700s is actually true for us today. In fact, we heard another similar message in the gospel that we heard read today because we know that John the Baptist came and he spoke to the people. He called them to repentance. He called them to faith in Jesus as their savior. Yes, some things never seem to change. In our time, just like in Amos's and also in John's time, God's people are called to make a change. That is to repent, to change their ways and to follow God's ways. God often uses visions to communicate with the prophets of the Old Testament. And if you've uh, read through the Old Testament, you'll see that this is very true. The vision that is used is usually a visual aid to make a particular point. And then the prophet takes that, that vision, that image, and he relates it to the people. So God gave Amos a vision, showing the Lord standing beside a a straight, uh, a straight wall with a plumb line in his hand. You see, a plumb line, and maybe some of you who are carpenters or who have uh, put things together or built a wall, a plumb line is used to actually measure whether or not something lines up with a standard. And if you've ever hung paintings or pictures on the wall, you know how important it is to get it in the right place so that it's not tipping over to one side or the other. Although not, not explicitly stated in our text, it is clear to us in the context that the results were not very good with the people of Israel. The people were not in line. They were not in line with God's will. That is the people of Israel. Israel was guilty of sin, guilty of greed, Guilty of sexual sins, guilty of false worship, and the list could go on. A laundry list of sins that the children of Israel had committed against God. Not at all the kind of holy life that God actually was calling the Israelites to live. And in our time, things are not really much different. God still calls for change. God still calls people to repent and come to believe in Jesus as their Savior and follow him. That still goes on today. It is still needed today. And so God uses that same plumb line with us as he did with Israel. We call them the Ten Commandments. That's the plumb line. The commandments show every individual to be definitely out of plumb. We're out of sync. There are many examples. Let's just, for instance, take the second commandment. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. I got to thinking about this, how things have really changed in our day and age. Take something as simple as the kind of language and the choice of words that many people use, even people who say they believe in God. Many use God's holy name in an unholy way. They take his name in vain. They curse. They swear. You hear it all the time. You can't even go and see a movie that doesn't use language that is offensive. And some people would say, oh, 
That's, you're so old-fashioned, that's the way it is, it's just that way. Many have made, have made foul and filthy language or words a part of their everyday speech. And this shows that we are out of plumb with God's word. But when we look at this commandment, this is only the tip of the iceberg. That's only one commandment, and there are more. We have to agree with Martin Luther's questions and answers in his small catechism where he asked the question, how do you know that you are a sinner? And the answer... From the Ten Commandments, which I have not kept. We have not kept the Ten Commandments. And God calls us to make some changes in our lives. It is clear that sin brings consequences. And in Amos' time, God would bring punishment on those who refuse to repent and change their sinful lives. And so sin brings consequences in our lives today and not just after we die. And so the prophet Amos proclaimed this judgment of God to the people. And the result, we are told, is that the house of Jeroboam and the king would be destroyed by the sword. The king would be put to death, the leader of the people at this time. And so Amos also said that Israel had to leave their homeland and they had to go into exile. They would be sent away from the promised land and they could no longer be allowed to live there. Amos made this proclamation in a town called Bethel, a town where a temple of the northern kingdom was built and was located. And there should have been a place where the people and the priests understood exactly what, what God was saying through the prophet Amos. But somehow they didn't get it. And the prophet Ezekiel says very clearly, the soul who sins shall die. Sin brings death. This word of God still applies today. And sometimes this means that we, must, that we must speak against sins that people don't want to hear about. Pastors today, just like the prophets, need to speak God's will today. And that isn't a popular thing when we are true to the very word of God. People don't want to hear the word of God. They want a feel-good message. They want to go away and say, everything's okay. Everything is okay, but not as a result of our sin. Everything's okay because of the grace of God. Everything's okay because of the forgiveness of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And so the sad reality of all of this is that most people will reject God's call to change. Look around us and see what is happening in our world today. There was a priest in the temple at Bethel that refused to believe what Amos, God's prophet, was actually saying and complained to Jeroboam, the king. He didn't like Amos. Amaziah didn't like that Amos said that Israel had to leave and go into exile and leave the promised land. But you see, the land... The land was part of the covenant that God made with Abraham. It was an agreement that God would be their God and they would be his people. And so the people of the northern kingdom had really sinned. They had messed up in a great way when it came to that covenant of God. They had broken the covenant. And so the temple at Bethel had become a place of pagan worship. They were not worshiping the true God anymore at Bethel. Amaziah told Amos to get out of there. He said, I don't want you around here anymore. Go back where you came from. Just stay away from us. That's how the prophet was treated. In our time, many people still reject God's call to repent and to change. We can expect some of the same rejection by the unbelieving world around us. And I was thinking of John the Baptist in that gospel lesson. He preached repentance. He said to King Herod that it wasn't good that he married his brother's wife. And he was put to death because he spoke the word of God. Jesus told the disciples, let's read it together. If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, 
but I chose you out of the world. Therefore, the world hates you. And so the hate shown to us may just be a cold shoulder, like Amaziah's hatred towards Amos, or it might be as violent as Herod's hatred for John the Baptist. And when a person has a change of heart, it makes a difference in their life. And when this happens, God's judgment turns away and it turns into forgiveness. That's why we go away with a good message. It wasn't Amos' idea to go to Bethel and call the people to repentance. In fact, he had a job. He, he would have been happy to stay home. He would have been happy just to be left alone to be a herdsman taking care of his cattle. And he was a grower of sycamore figs. He was happy to do this. But God said, no, I don't want you to do that anymore. I want you to go and I want you to prophesy to the people. Okay, Lord, I'll do it. He answered the call. Why? The Lord longs to pull back from punishing his people. He is gracious and he's compassionate and he's loving. And so he sent Amos to declare judgment for the sole purpose that Israel would have a change of heart, that they would repent and that they would turn from their sin back to God in faith. And then God would eagerly forgive. This is the Old Testament message of Amos. And God brings a message of grace. This is the good news. This is the gospel in Amos' message that God does not want to punish, but he wants to forgive. And it's no different today. A change of heart, a repentant heart, still changes God's judgment to forgiveness and love and mercy. And God's heart is all for us. As sinful as we may be, he loves us. He loves us. His love is evident in the sending of Jesus to be our Savior. And that's what the Old Testament prophets were doing, pointing to the coming Christ. All the prophets pointed to Jesus who would come, who would die on the cross, who would, would rise again. His love is so evident in the act of sending his son Jesus to us. And so even in our day, God calls pastors to proclaim both law and gospel at the same time. And it may make people uncomfortable. And it may point out that perhaps we have not been following God's ways. But then we turn and we repent and we hear God's forgiveness. We hear his compassion and his mercy. We do not have to go into exile like the children of Israel. Jesus already paid the price of our sins. In fact, Jesus went into exile for us. He went into exile for us on the cross. He paid the price of our sin. We do not have to worry. We are forgiven. And heaven is ahead. And that isn't going to change. Some things never change, my friends. That never changes. C.S. Lewis, the Christian writer, in his work, Perlandra Trilogy, describes the world that we know as being bent and literally out of shape. It is the cross that is, the true, that is true to plumb. We're talking about that plumb line. And the rest of the world is crooked C.S. Lewis says. And so St. Paul calls the cross the wisdom of God that the world considers actually foolishness, and yet the cross is always pointing to Jesus. It always reminds us of Jesus, and everything else is crooked by comparison. Everything else in the world is not true to plumb. As much as we want it to be, it is not. And my guess, friends, is that if you are like me, there are some days when the world looks more crooked than other days. And it brings us down. But here's something to think about. As long as we stay attached to the cross of Jesus Christ, his suffering and death, the blood that he shed for us for the forgiveness of sins and heaven to come, we will then be able to see when we are off plumb. And we will fall on our knees and ask for forgiveness. Because the cross, the cross of Jesus Christ will keep pointing us straight to Jesus. Every single day of our lives. Thank God.
that some things never change. God's love for us in Jesus is still offered to all people. And all God's people said, Amen. Peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus unto life everlasting. Amen.